at the Meyer Elevator right now. The water level at portions of the levee as it is at the top of the levee. Okay, do you need volunteers at Meyer? You are our eyes right now to what's happening out there, so give us a call and uh, help not only us out, but everyone else who might be listening. Is the Hannibal Bridge closed? Thunderstorms are likely tonight in the National Weather Service still saying locally heavy rain. They're patrolling, they are sandbagging, they are cutting brush so they can get to even more levees, so that they can get maybe get some bulldozers in. To... It's holding its own right now, and I don't see any real problem at this time. We are this morning, um, I have declared a state of disaster for the city of Canton. The sandbagging efforts are continuing at Gregory's Landing, also Alexandria, uh, Canton, just about up and down the Mississippi for that matter. West Quincy, they're still sandbagging. The gentleman just called about the road from Hamilton to Nauvoo. Can you tell me what the river stage is at Quincy, please? Where is it all going to go? I've been out an hour and a half, and at length of time, the river has come up just in excess of one inch. This is stress 106 because you're fearful and anxious that something is going to happen, and how you're going to react if it does happen. If, if they can do it on courage alone, I think they're going to make it. The west end of the railroad bridge, you can see where there's uh, water now reaching the lower levels of the under support structure. And uh, that's another indication of how high the water has risen here in the last 24 hours. He said further north, Highway 96 is completely flooded. The break in the levee was to the east of town on the Mississippi River. You go on down to the side, looking at it from the air, it's a scary sight. Will that Marion County break they have have any effect on what's going we will be bagging as long as we possibly can. Well, right now we've been running our equipment into the ground, so we uh, need some mechanics. We wanted to tell you that the only thing that's going to shut this operation down tonight is the lack of people to fill up sandbags. You right now I just got information that we're going to add another 600 uh, soldiers late tonight, early tomorrow morning, which will drive up the, uh, the totals of Army and Air National Guardsmen operating in the Quincy area to approximately 2,000 soldiers and airmen. As the year 1993 progressed in the tri-state area, the signs were there. A damp winter followed by a wet spring, and as spring turned into summer, a Mississippi River already a bankful, unwilling to start its usual summer drop until the rains ended. But the rain didn't stop as the summer of 1993 began. Instead, showers continued to douse the tri-state area, and ominously, Mississippi River tributaries to the north continued to fill to bankful as storm after storm rolled through the Midwest. And then came a downpour sounding the alarm bell that the great flood of 1993 was underway. Yes, Corey, that's right. In fact, the skies opened on the night of June 30th, and Quincy recorded five to six inches of rain, and even larger amounts fell to the north. Again, the best possibility is going to come uh, sometime tomorrow as we see that very uh, strong cold front start to work its way through the area. And again, we could uh, see some rather serious weather, so do keep an eye out for tomorrow. That could be the real focus of our attention. As a cold... The next day, Thursday, July 1st, WGEM Radio began 24-hour-a-day coverage, and News Channel 10 went to an expanded newscast to cover the big rain and the impending flood. WGEM undertook a plan of intensive coverage that would last for the entire duration of the flood. As the floodwaters rise, Quincy's Memorial Bridge is closed. And tri-state area residents brace themselves for a record flood. Good evening, I'm Russ Sachs. And I'm Mark Baker. The flood of 93 was one for the record books, but the stage is set for one that could even be worse. That's right, indeed, the flood of 73 was a record breaker, but this one could be worse. Roads and bridges already are closed around the area, and residents and businesses are moving to higher ground. As the newscast of July 1st unfolded, we learned that West Quincy businesses were already packing up. Residents were being advised to evacuate the Meyer area. Sections of Highway 61 in Missouri were closed. And some LaGrange, Missouri residents were already knee-deep in water when News Channel 10's Michelle McCormack visited the scene. 
Residents living on the edge were pushed to the limit overnight. Three inches of rainfall made the Mississippi too much to handle. The Walton Mobile Home was successfully evacuated by 1 o'clock Thursday. The speed with which the water lapped up to the front door is what alarmed owner Walt Walton. I was here in 86 and it only came up to the edge here, at the edge of the parking area. And uh, I got up this morning at 3 o'clock. It was about 15 inches from my yard. And now it's just been moving ever, ever since. Neighbor Curtis Farr had memories of even farther back. He left for work Wednesday night. By his return, he knew it was time to leave once again. And when I came back here in the morning, it looked like 1973 all over again. It was so, uh, it just gotten so high. It, I kept looking out the door over there at Can-Am all night long, wondering how this was going to affect it when I got home, and I sure seen it. Curtis says if he knew for sure that the water would stop right where it's at now, he wouldn't move. But he doesn't know, so he's packing up. Curtis's uncle feels on the bad side of the dice. His belt-high corn growing near the Wyaconda River is now under the river. Well, we just lost another year. That's about the only thing you can do. And you're going to stay positive about farming next yeah, year? Yeah, we'll be, we'll be back. We'll be back. The evacuation of the park set off a chain reaction through downtown as Route B became more of a waterway as the day progressed. The post office is now operating out of Notre Dame Catholic Church, and the library is still searching for a new place to go. Residents in water up to their home's foundations say they're thankful friends are around to help. Michelle McCormack, News Channel 10 for Floodwatch 93 in LaGrange, Missouri. As July 1st came to an end, the Tri-State area faced the prospect of a holiday weekend mark without much to celebrate. Well, that's right, Les. It looked like many people would be spending their holiday weekend protecting their homes and businesses. Water was high at Alexandria, Missouri, and sandbaggers were working feverishly to protect Meyer and Nyota, Illinois. The unprotected areas of Hannibal were already underwater, while the city's flood wall kept downtown dry. It was just two days ago that residents on Hannibal's floodplain were gritting their teeth and bearing it. At that time, only two blocks were ankle high in water. But by Friday morning, the bravery erupted into anger and sometimes tears, as at least five more blocks were surrounded by water knee high. I can get to my house. It's all flooded. You can you, you walk down yourself. You, you can get to. I just lost about twenty thousand dollars. My furniture and everything. As residents evacuated, they said they would be back, and this time armed with a petition, which they claim already has one hundred signatures. They want the flood wall protecting downtown to be extended to protect them as well. They charge that the wall is pushing more water south into their neighborhoods. Hannibal City Engineer says it's hydraulically impossible that the flood wall in downtown is causing the flooding on the south side of the city. In fact, he says what it does is it sends the current in a straight line rather than curving in near Bear Creek. And what the residents there are experiencing is backwater. The folks down there in Bear Creek say that's an awful lot of backwater. Even if it's just a dirt wall, you don't got to put no a bridge or nothing else up there or anything. All we want is a dirt wall going to the leak to save our property. It's no more than fair for the city to do that because just like I said, we pay taxes too. On July 2nd, bridges at Hannibal and Louisiana closed and Alexandria evacuated as a levee there breaks. When the levee at Alexandria broke Thursday, it marked the third break of a major levee in Clark County within a week. With this break, the Mississippi River simply absorbed the town of Alexandria, which is now under as much as 13 feet of water. Makes you sick. Everything you work for and build it up from Mud Street to Blacktop. We got a new community center we just built. We haven't even got it finished. It cleared the roof of it. Uh, it just makes you sick to even look at anything. The biggest problem, at least for the moment, is finding shelter for those displaced by the flood Many have been taken in by other families in nearby communities, yet many are still without a place to stay. About 60 people have been spending most of their time at the Wayland Fire Department. Indeed, right now we need housing, showers. Uh, that's, a, that's priority right now. People need housing. But to people who have already endured this, disaster relief seems like a million miles away. Our hands are tied until the governor makes a formal request for federal uh, assistance. I've talked to everybody that I know of to talk to, and everybody says until the governor makes this formal request, 
they can't act. That's adding insult to injury for those who have lost their homes, like the Youngs. It was, you know, you were expecting, we were expecting it. The levee was built for one in 50 years, and 47 was the last one, so it was bound to happen. You just never hope it does, but that's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I hope we get back. Yeah. That's all I can hope. Those who have seen this destruction firsthand say they still can't believe it. This is the north side of Alexandria, one of the spots where the levee gave way. And as you can see behind me, water continues to rush into town at an incredible rate. In fact, those taking boats have to cross six miles of 10 foot or higher water just to get to Alexandria. Tony Shaw, News Channel 10, Alexandria, Missouri. 6,000 acres of farmland near Gregory Landing went underwater when a secondary levee broke. But all the other levees were holding as July 4th drew to a close. On July 5th, another bridge spanning over the Mississippi was closed due to rising water. Along with the closing of the bridge at Keokuk, most of Pontusic, Illinois, was now underwater. But far to the south, in the now famous Sny Island Drainage District, the situation was described as not serious, even though Illinois Governor Jim Edgar had ordered 150 Illinois National Guard troops to New Canton to help out. This contingent would be the first of some 2,500 troops called in to help on the levees in Illinois. By July 7th, virtually all the levees in the area were at or approaching critical stages. At Durgeons Creek near LaGrange, a secondary levee broke, flooding 4,000 acres. More National Guard troops arrived to help. The Red Cross opened disaster centers in Hannibal and LaGrange, and Governor Edgar requested emergency disaster declarations for 12 counties, including Adams, Hancock, and Pike. The river continued to swell, and Canton, Missouri residents got the call to move to higher ground. Forty National Guards people have been called to Canton, Missouri, where a voluntary evacuation has been activated and sandbagging efforts have been stepped up. Waters are lapping very close to the top of the levee wall. I feel like we're in a dangerous position right now. Uh, if we can continue holding the water back on this north side, um, we just got to try to stay ahead of it. The levee wall here on the north side of Canton stands about 20 feet high. The idea is to take sandbags and wood and add at least three feet more and hold off the Mississippi River as long as possible. But should the worst happen, Missouri not only has access to state monies, but federal assistance as well. The information I've received by Thursday, the federal paperwork would be done and the area would be declared a federal disaster area. By that, uh, during the flood, we'll be able to get some federal equipment, some federal assistance, but it also means after the flood and the cleanup and things like that, there will also be some programs available for residents who had to move out. There will be those who lost things during the flood. The volunteers here are hedging Canton's bets, something officials with the Union District levy were doing until last night when they pulled the engines from the pump station just south of LaGrange. Soon after, it did break. Yeah, up there it did. And the mighty Mississippi poured over the levee for several miles to Durgan's Creek and into 4,000 acres of farmland. Some do. farmers were able to cut their wheat earlier this week, but the corn and soybean was lost. All five families living on the floodplain evacuated safely. And as the river moves closer to 61, residents just on the edge remain undaunted. It's happened in 73, so it's just a time, one of those things that happens. Yeah. You just pick up and go on. <laughs> Michelle McCormack, News Channel 10 in Lewis County, Missouri. To the north and across the river, Concerns Mount near Warsaw and along the Hunt Drainage District. By bulldozer and by manpower, workers continue to heighten the levee in central Illinois. In Meyer, members of the National Guard and prisoners from the Clayton Work Camp are using sandbags to raise the height of the levee. All day, the levee commissioner has been instructing us as to where the problem areas are. We've been so instructing our soldiers to have a combination basically from the 232nd Battalion, uh, instructing them, and they're levering the high levels. We're taking sandbags about two or three high. Further north, the same story in the Hunt Drainage District, but here, workers are using bulldozers to combat the rising water. Up till now, drainage officials have been most concerned about seepage and sand boils through the levee. But with the new crest predictions for later in the week, unless they raise the levee, they said the water would simply come up over the top. We moved the berm up probably another three feet from what it was before. We feel pretty confident where we can hold it in this area for as 
as long as the rain doesn't uh, keep going. In Warsaw, residents aren't beefing up a levee because there isn't one. The river has swelled over a quarter of a mile of land reaching the lower portion of town. Homeowners are sandbagging around their homes trying to keep the rising river out. Have you moved your stuff out of your house? No. No, we did all the neighbors last night, but so far we haven't moved ours. Are you going to just keep it in and try to barricade the water we're out? We're trying. Yeah, we're hoping. And that hope rings out up and down the Mississippi, but some drains officials say somewhere all this hard work may be all for naught. You know, it's a matter of wills of where it's going to break first. And hopefully, you know, it ain't here, but maybe down below or something like that. George Eversman, News Channel 10, West Central Illinois. Water tops levees at Gregory Landing, forcing farmers to evacuate. And the river at Quincy reaches 29 feet, an all-time high. On July 8th, the city of Quincy is under a state of emergency. An unprecedented volunteer effort is underway at the Quincy University Stadium parking lot. Just like a family, Quincy is pulling together under the state of flood emergency. Mayor Chuck Schultz organized the sandbagging effort at 10.30 this morning. Within an hour, the operation was fully underway. It's wonderful. It's just really uh, heartwarming. What we have here are Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and ball teams that got rained out today. Uh, we've got business executives, moms, uh, working shoulder to shoulder, uh, pulling together for the, for the whole area, and it's, it's great. Sand is coming in by the truckload. Its destination is West Quincy, Meyer, and other areas with weakened levees. But first, the sand needs to be bagged. For that, entire families have come to help. You know, a lot of people didn't know that the kids could help out a little bit. And that's what I said. Out here, there's no water. Parents are worried about the kids getting in the water, but there's no water here for them, so. And there again, there was a lot of parents that wanted to get involved and were afraid to have to pay for a babysitter. This way, everybody can chip in and help together. There's still time to join the effort. Officials say the sandbagging will continue at least through midnight. Friday, July 9th, the Fort Madison Bridge closes, and that evening, the levee at Meyer breaks. A major levee breaks on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River tonight. And now it's only a matter of hours before 30,000 more acres of farmland will be underwater. Good evening, I'm Mark Baker. And I'm Shan Whiston. Another levee break in the area. There are no reports of injuries. We'll have a live report from Meyer in just a moment. The levee gave in about 1,000 feet south of the Meyer elevator at about 5.30 this evening. Eyewitnesses say the initial break was about 30 feet. This video, shot within an hour of the break, shows it widening to about 50 feet. The river dropped two inches at Meyer within the first hour. Nearby fields were filling up rapidly. In due course, with the river at this level, all the old 28,000 acres that comprise Lima Lake as well as Hunt and Drains District will be underwater. And uh, you know, we've rough estimates of dollars lost in terms of crops. You know, perhaps 10 or so million dollars worth of crops. How long do you think it'll take to fill it up? Well, Ian, it's tough to say. From this, this is one of the lower points of the district here. Uh, Back in 1960, I understand it took almost 54 hours, but that was with a six or eight foot less height to the river. This is an old, uh, durable uh, gravel gumbo type levee that'll take longer to erode than the sand levees in other parts of the district. And as if that weren't bad enough, now there's a break on the Bear Creek levee in the same district. And everyone who lives in the Lima Lake and Hunt drainage districts are moving quickly to get out. The McAllister family worked frantically to move gas tanks and other equipment while the National Guard and the Sheriff's Department patrolled the roads trying to make sure everyone could get out safely. All we're going to do now is make sure that everybody's out of the area and uh, nobody gets uh, in here and gets trapped. But unfortunately, scenes like this are becoming all too familiar these days. It's really a valiant effort and it's, uh, I can't tell you how sorry I am we weren't successful. The weekend of July 10th, the Indian Grave Drainage District north of Quincy is in serious trouble while the valiant fight to save Nyota is lost. This is where the levee broke, on the west edge of Nyota. A secondary levee also gave way. Now water is coming over the railroad tracks and over the tops of sandbags that once held the levee. Water is still coming into town. Nyota is just across the Mississippi from Fort Madison, Iowa. This is the road that leads to the closed Fort Madison Bridge. Residents say they're saddened, but not surprised by what's happened. I was down on the levee and I had to stay there and make sure all my men got off the levee. The inmates got off and all the other volunteers got off the levee. I sent life jackets down to make sure that they could get off. And as soon as they got the last man off, we all 
headed up to the tin shed up here to get organized, and we went on out to church to have a head count out there and make sure everybody did get out of town. I'm more lucky, I only got about five inches on my floor, but most of them, a lot of them are clear underwater. I feel, I feel lucky. Panic, get out of here. So I went to Nauvoo, so you do what you have to do when you have to do it, and gotta let it go. This is what's left of Main Street in Iota, Illinois. Dozens of rooftops and businesses you can only distinguish by their floating signs. All residents were safely evacuated before the levee break. Now they've come back to see the unthinkable and to assess the damage. Many things they won't be able to replace, but residents say they'll rebuild and they'll move back. Yeah, two weeks of work down the drain. Then it come up through the drain again to us, so it's gone. But we'll survive. You really need Temporary you. housing, you know, uh, a lot of people don't have nowhere to go. This is the town's fire department that was once command central for the levy work. The first order of business was to have the utility company come in and disconnect power. We got a boat ride with the phone company who was trying to pump out water from its station so phone service can be restored. The last flood an iota resident saw was in 1946. Water is several feet higher now than in these pictures. One fortunate note, the town has a boat dealership, so crews were moving out boats so residents could get to their homes and to some pets still stranded in the water. Another big concern now is a huge oil slick running through town. Residents say it could be coming from a nearby pipeline. So they have both water damage and oil damage to contend with once the river level goes down. Shan Whiston, News Channel 10, Nyota, Illinois. As Monday, July 12th dawns, word comes of another levee break. The South Indian grave is underwater while the fight continues in areas that remain flood free. Yet another levee along the Mississippi River gives way. This one at Indian Graves north of Quincy. More than 8,000 acres of farmland are now underwater. Good evening, I'm Shan Weston. I'm Wes Sachs. The raging Mississippi River continues to reclaim bottomland as the great flood of 1993 continues. News Channel 10's Tom Bodek has our first flood watch report tonight on the river's latest victim. He joins us now live from the river bottoms near Ursa, Illinois. Tom? Well, thank you, Shan and Les. The Snaking River continued its rise overnight as waters from the north continued to push to the south. Local residents here could only work and wonder where it would strike next, and strike it did. The levee failed near the Baseline Road. Thousands of gallons of murky Mississippi water pushed through the opening, which quickly grew to nearly a half mile long. The waters consumed nearly 8,000 acres of prime farmland. High on the bluff overlooking the river valley, Carol Leiter's backyard became a main observation point. Well, it's their livelihood. It's everyone's livelihood down here. This is how they, you know, this is how they live. I mean, they need to, to make their money to survive. and. Right now, who knows? Who really knows? It's really a sad time for us. Really a sad time. Losing Lima Lake for my family, my own father's family, and then losing this for my, my husband's family, it's really hard. You wonder how much your kids will remember. I don't know. This one just celebrated her sixth birthday last week, and it's kind of like a real interesting birthday week. So, I don't know. It's just really, really hard. It's harder for my husband. It's, you know, this, he's lived down here his entire life. Farther upriver, Mark Vanderhaar has spent the last few days building a levee around his house and outbuildings. Although he's next to the bluff, he's worried. I've lived here since 1977, and this would be the first time for me for, for going through a flood. I don't see how these farmers can do this. Being, I guess being raised with it might help them out a little bit, but these guys are under a lot more pressure than I'm under. I mean, they're losing their livelihood, you know, and uh, it's gonna totally wipe them out. The biggest drainage district in our area, the Snide Drainage District, is still holding. That district includes 110,000 acres and stretches 52 miles along Adams and Pike County, Illinois. Well, Tony Shaw standing by live where some frantic last-minute work is going on. And what's the latest there, Tony? Shannon Les, as one farmer told me, if the Snide levee breaks loose, all hell will break loose. But volunteers and National Guardsmen are doing all they can to prevent that from happening. Aerial view shows that the levee along the Snide Drainage District is still doing its job, but the question everyone's asking is, how much longer can it hold? Joe Henninger lives in a trailer just a hundred yards from the levee. You think you're going to be able to save all this land? We're hoping. That's 
best I can say right now. Just working, praying and trusting the Lord. The crest level here is expected to be around 32 feet by as early as tomorrow evening. Drainage officials know that's not enough time to sandbag, so they're bulldozing sand on top of the levee to increase its height by two feet. It's their last ditch effort to save the district. We're taking an increased risk with, with this decision to thin the levee up, but the alternative is to let it go over the top, which is completely unacceptable. As you can see, water continues to seep through the sand. Now, the straw is being used to alleviate that problem. What it'll do is help anchor the sand in place and prevent it from eroding away. Or at least that's the hope. If this doesn't work, 40,000 acres of farmland and many homes will find themselves under as much as 12 feet of water. If the levee break in this area, not only would it affect the farmers in the area, but the town of Hull would it'd be a disaster for the town of Hall. I don't know if it'll ever recover and come back to be as nice a town as it is now. It'd really be tough. It affects everything. It affects the school districts. It affects the, the townships. It affects everything in the, in the area. And my heart goes out to everybody in the area that's suffered these levee breaks already. I know it's a terrible thing, and we're just trying to avoid it here. Well, the switch to straw has been made in West Quincy, where sandbags are being used to hold down top levee plastic, straw now being used to stop seepage. News Channel 10's Nora Baldner is standing by live in West Quincy for an update, and she has more. Nora, what's happening there? Well, we've got a more stable situation than in the Snye Levee District, as you just saw Tony Shaw reporting. In fact, I can see only about two lone sandbaggers on the levee. Earlier this morning, they were applying it with the plastic down at the other end where the sandbaggers are now. Obviously, they think they've got the levee high enough. They're worried now about what's seeping through the bottom. Four wheelers will drop the straw. All right. All right, ladies, we want you just to fill in the wash. Have we got four wheelers coming? A handful of faithful levee workers started their day restructuring their attack on the West Quincy levee. It's now high enough to withstand the latest crest predictions but the problem isn't on top anymore, it's on the bottom. We have water seeping through the sand, and, and as the water congregates and gets more volume, it starts a little erosions down our sand levee. Water has been eating away at the full height of the levee for weeks now, weakening the levee's ability to hold back a crest, let alone several more days of water pressure. Take it down the bulldozer track. We'll spread it out. Spreading straw is supposed to filter out the water, leaving the sand where it's needed most on the levee. That would continue to dig deeper and deeper. It would gradually work its way up the levee and then go over the top, and we can't have that. The West Quincy effort has been joined by drainage district crews from all along the river. They say this could happen just as easily to them. It's mind-boggling. That's about all I can tell you. We've had high water back in my district before, but nothing like this. And Hare says it's the volunteer spirit that's holding the levee and the workers together. We have bonded together that I believe that we can hold that river out by holding hands, which we've done. As the 12th of July closes, the Burlington Iowa Bridge shuts down, leaving the Quincy Bayview Bridge as the only link between Illinois and Missouri along a vast stretch of river. But this time, too, national attention has started to focus on the Quincy area. This is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Sitting in tonight is Brian Williams. Good evening. Fed by record rainfall and heading downstream now with a vengeance. The Mississippi River tonight continues its destructive path through the American Midwest, flowing over its banks and inundating entire communities. From Davenport, Iowa to St. Louis, Missouri, the river is rising from 7 to over 13 feet above flood sage in an area that covers several states. Mark Twain's hometown of Hannibal, Missouri tonight is known instead for its fight against the rising water. NBC's Kenley Jones is there. Now it's Missouri's turn as the crest moves down the 361 miles of the Mississippi that borders the state. Hundreds of communities and thousands of people are bracing for the highest water in 20 years. Among them is Hannibal, where officials are counting on a new $8 million mile-long levee to keep the Mark Twain tourist attractions dry. 
So far, it's working. It's been a lifesaver this year. We'd, have been, we'd be out of business. We'd be standing right now in about three foot of water. It was great. It was the best thing that's happened to Hannibal. While most of downtown Hannibal is high and dry, low-lying areas not protected by the levee are underwater. About 50 homes have been evacuated in this low-income neighborhood, where few of the residents can afford flood insurance. Many are angry that the levee was not extended to keep the river out of their homes as well as business establishments. 77-year-old Raymond Newland says the city has its priorities backwards. They should have built to protect their lives, not just a few. Tourists want to after them. They need after the people, the tourists. Hannibal's mayor says neither the city nor the federal government has the estimated $25 million it would cost to extend the levy. He's not sure it would be worth it anyway. The cost-benefit ratio of even the project that was constructed was, uh, was borderline. Residents of flooded homes here may get some more bad news. The city will argue that they should not be permitted to use disaster relief funds to repair damaged houses on the floodplain, where Old Man River is bound to rise again. Kenley Jones, NBC News, Hannibal, Missouri. On the 13th, parts of Hull get the word to evacuate. And I told my husband, I'll stay till I see the first snake, and then I'm gone. <laughs> Thelma Johnson and her husband held out as long as they could, but her children and grandchildren said it was now time to pack up and move out. It's time, I guess. I still don't think it'll break, but some of our things were... Uh, they could get damaged just from the dampness. Almost all of Thelma's 800 neighbors in Hull have moved their belongings to higher ground. The town's gas station has pulled its pumps, and the Church of the Nazarene is preparing for the potential flooding as well. We took our piano and most of our pulpit furniture up to the Nazarene Church in Quincy with a pickup truck, and today we rented the van to get the pews out. They're special pews because they, they were all re-varnished uh, re by hand by a, a member who's died and gone to heaven. But, uh, her son is still a member of the church, and uh, there's other special, so we want to get him out and save him. One of the few things staying open in Hull is the town bank. The bank officials have moved out most of the furniture, its computers, and customer account records. And employees are ready to water seal the vault if the levee breaks. We'll put Vaseline on the vault door and put the plastic over it and put vault, we put sandbags over the, you know, in front of the door. At the river, residents are working feverishly to keep the town's vacant homes dry. Bob Colgrove says the levee near Hull is built up to about 33 feet, only half a foot above the predicted crest. We didn't want anyone to get excited. There are probably three-fourths of the town has already moved out, but they just want them to be alerted when it gets to this stage that uh, anything can happen and to avoid the confusion, why do it now instead of waiting till right at the last minute and get somebody hurt in all the confusion. This is the closest section of the Mississippi River to the town of Hull. We're about five miles to the west of town. Colgrove says if the levee were to break right here, it would take anywhere from three to six hours for the floodwaters to reach the homes of Hull. An east-west diversion levee built south of Hull in the 1960s has divided the 110,000 acres in the Sny Island District, hopefully protecting around half of it if the 52-mile levee breaks at one location. George Eversman, News Channel 10, Paul, Illinois. And before the sun sets on this day, more levees break. Good evening, I'm Shan Wiston. Coming up on News Channel 10, Flood Watch 93 continues with the powerful Mississippi claiming two more levees. First at the South Drainage District in Marion County, Missouri, and a second levee break about 8 o'clock tonight. And Shan, there is a full-scale evacuation south of Ursa tonight. I'll have a live report. Well, meanwhile, the levees at West Quincy and Hull, Illinois, are holding as tensions rise. Flood Watch 93 is next. Good evening, I'm Shan Whiston. The mighty Mississippi continues to pick up speed, wiping out levees in its path. Two tonight alone. The latest break happened about 8 o'clock tonight at the north end of the Indian Graves Drainage District near Ursa, Illinois. News Channel 10's Mark Baker is on the scene at Indian Graves. He joins us live now with more. Mark? Well, Shan, it's quite a sight here. I'm about a mile west of Ursa. The levee broke at the Sand Ridge about five miles west of here. Uh, the water, of course, filling up the Ursa Bottoms right now. And over my shoulder, you can probably see uh, some of the cars continuing to come out of the Ursa Bottoms, although the activity has slowed down somewhat. There's an interchange down below the hill here. Where there's been a lot of activity tonight. Uh, the guardsmen obviously doing a very good job of trying to direct what could be pretty chaotic. 
Leonard Schnellbacher, who is the Adams County Emergency Management Coordinator, joins us now. And Leonard, we understand there was uh, a problem with some people on the levee and the National Guard had to bring in a chopper to get them out. Can you uh, confirm that for us? There was a chopper and they did bring some people out and they done a, a complete search of the uh, levee system and all the homes around the area just to check to make sure everybody did get out safely. Can you tell us how the evacuations go? Well, a second levee break tonight. Earlier this evening, levee crews lost their battle with the river in Marion County as the South River levee broke in two places. News Channel 10's Tom Vodak has that report. The first break occurred just east of the South River pump station on Highway 168. Floodwaters came pouring into the area known as Bay de Charles. Oh, it's unfortunate that uh, people work all their lives build something and they had a really nice place down here and it's just gone in a few minutes. Uh, any idea of how high the water is going to get here by, by your property? Well, they're predicting 31 to 32 foot and that'll that'll be up just about it to my house at 32 foot. We moved out our basement. Is that That's about all we had to do because the upper part of our home is is plenty high and, it, and I don't think it'll be affected. Have you lived out here very long? Two years. Okay, so you've never seen anything like this? I don't think anybody has. <laughs> The water quickly engulfed several homes, including the Bayview Campground. Our levee has never busted. Uh, and it was built originally in 1903. And the levee slid out, and it just, uh, there was about 100, <clears throat> 150 foot of it down there, which was the sand levee, and it just slid out. Just, just a big sand pile now. There are not only residences along Highway 168, but there are businesses as well. Bly Construction Company has its main headquarters here. Bly will have four feet of water at its front door. Farther up the river valley, the American Sanamid chemical plant was safely evacuated. The plant itself is protected by its own levee, but a skeleton crew will remain to man the facility. Tom Vodak, News Channel 10, Marion County, Missouri. And throughout this week in mid-July, the rains continue to fall flash flood watches are the norm. This is our situation. Radar wise, the showers continue to move through the area. And as you mentioned, a flash flood watch is in effect for the same old spot, northern Missouri and extreme west central Illinois. You can see some rather light activity going on around the Quincy and Hannibal area. What we're really concerned with, though, is a moving now into west central uh, Missouri and these storms are moving to the northeast and they're rather vigorous as you can see they will probably be pushing into our area later tonight on top of all that saturated ground we couldn't find ourselves in a real flash flood situation don't want to alarm anyone the week of July 13th progresses the river is swollen at 31 and a half feet levees are soggy but holding relief efforts mount it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to see all the work going into when the levees didn't hold the first ones we were on. And I was on the levee the night before it broke, and I, I'll just be honest with you, I was really frightened. I was scared. Yeah. Easiest thing to say is they're just flat flooded. Uh, we come over one hill this morning, and it actually looked like the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is, I would say, about the third largest flood I've been on this large. These are war stories from the battle against the Mississippi. They come from Red Cross volunteers who keep the fight going from behind the scenes. From this kitchen at Quincy University's North Campus, volunteers are feeding more than 3,000 people a day. More help is needed. We don't know what to expect. We, we're really going hour by hour, you know, because if we get a call in saying they need 15 or 1,700 dinners, then that means we've got to get geared up. So we can always use volunteers. We will not turn any down. Food is everywhere, but the volunteers are not limited to the kitchen. While Donna Stork usually makes sandwiches, she has also delivered them. And I wanted to see if the people were really getting enough food and so forth. And uh, a lot of the kids were just sitting, you know. And I kind of forced them to eat. <laughs> I went over and I just handed this one kid a couple bananas and I said, you really need this. You need this. You know, I think it does us all good to go and see where this is going. And there's a big need. To meet that need, about 40 IRVs, emergency response vehicles, have been sent to Quincy from all over the country. They deliver food and supplies. Volunteer Johnny Walker doesn't need an IRV. He uses a pickup truck to take supplies to troubled areas. Everything that the Red Cross is doing is very important. There's people that wouldn't be eating or anything else if it wasn't for the Red Cross. Uh, we're taking a lot of supplies in, but what some of the people don't see is we also help people get stuff out. We make a trip down, but we also make it back. And uh, this vehicle, no, it's never empty when we come back either. 
If it seems like hard work, it is. But these volunteers keep coming back because the job offers much more than just war stories. It's just a good feeling. I don't really know how to put it. You know, it's just a good feeling to be able to help. It also makes you feel good, like that you are doing something worthwhile. We all like to do things that are worthwhile, make a difference. Sometimes it's just a matter of reaching out and shaking somebody's hand or putting your arm around someone and giving them a little bit of moral support along with a soda or a cold drink or a sandwich or a hot meal. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what makes it all worthwhile to me. Bob Siegel, News Channel 10, Quincy. July 16th starts as another day in the battle. More than 100,000 acres of land are underwater. News Channel 10 on this day starts at 6 p.m. newscast with a view of the flooding with the first broadcast live from a helicopter. News Channel 10's Tom Vodak is in an Army National Guard helicopter right now. He joins us live with this report from the air. Tom? Thank you. Thank you, Shan. We're in Army National Guard chopper number 492. There with the 106th Aviation Battalion out of Chicago, Decatur, and Peoria. And we thank them immensely for giving us this opportunity. Right now, we are flying over the East Hannibal area. Uh, we can see, actually see Michelle McCormack at the, and Rick Junkerman just down below us right now. But we are right over the Stye Levy District right now. We were up in the Horseshoe Bend area just a little bit ago, and uh, the situation is this right now. They are doing some sandbagging along the levee, but they're basically loading the sandbags into boats and taking them out to areas where they are needed. The condition of the levee right now, as you can see, is uh, very soggy right now. There you see a boat in the water just uh, taking some sandbags to the south as we are flying south along the Sinai District Levee just south of the city of Hannibal. Uh, there are no foot patrols out on the levee right now. Uh, we do have some workers out there, as we saw just a moment ago, uh, working on the lawn up on top of the levee. But right now, they do not want a whole lot of action on top of the levee. They do not want people walking up and down on it. Uh, we were up in the South Quincy Drainage District a little bit ago, and we did see some four-wheelers up along the top of the levee. The levee in the South Quincy Drainage District is in very good shape. But here is the situation down here. We've got these levees that are so waterlogged right now that uh, they're just taking it an hour at a time, and things are holding right now. Uh, there are some trouble spots where they are still working, but again, the situation from up here that we can see, uh, things are holding along the Snyde Drainage District. We'll hopefully be able to check in with you again, Shan, less in just a moment, uh, closer to the weather, and let you know what the situation is at that time. Reporting live from Chopper 492 of the Army National Guard about the Sny Levy District south of Hannibal, Tom Bodak, Blood Watch 93. Okay. On the night of the 16th, as the remaining levees looked as if they would hold for another day, tragedy strikes West Quincy. The break occurred, occurred about a half mile from the uh, side of the Bayview Bridge that touches West Quincy. Our reports indicate eyewitnesses have told us here on the scene that it took from the point of this break to pour where the gas station used to be only about five minutes, which indicates that the water is moving very quickly. Witnesses have also told us who are working on the sand levee say that they saw multiple sand slides and boils on the levee about two hours before it actually broke, which was supposed to be 22 to 8. And if you could see behind me right here, okay, if we could have you move out of the way. This is the Airco station, folks, in West Quincy. It has just ignited. It appears that the blaze originated at the back of these white storage tanks of some kind and now has progressed. It is now reaching the point of the Bayview Bridge, which lies in West Quincy, Missouri. For those of you who are just joining us, there's been a break a half mile from the Bayview Bridge in West Quincy, Missouri. That is a break in the West Quincy, Missouri levee. Water is spilling out over in into West Quincy and people understandably are being asked to evacuate the premises because of a fire that has erupted at the Air Coast storage station. Gentlemen, back behind the squad car now. Again, the Illinois Department of Transportation has confirmed that the break occurred a half mile north of the Bayview Bridge. We have no indication that there were workers working at the area which broke. In fact, our latest reports indicate that workers on the West Quincy levee were actually seven miles north of here. 
Of course, we'll try and locate the proper authorities and find that out as soon as you can. The heat is really intense right now. It feels as hot as it was today at 12 noon on those levees. It is that intense. Smoke is billowing into the air, obviously, you can see it. Now, this happened three minutes ago. This was three minutes ago, folks. And the current, which is obviously very strong, is carrying the fire with it, with the same force that it was traveling with the water. We're being instructed to leave. Uh, Mr. House, uh, you were up in the air and shot some uh, compelling video of what occurred. Let's roll that video, and if you would, sir, explain to us, uh, you've been through this before, but for those just joining us, explain to us your circumstances, or what you saw, and let's take a look at that video if we can. That uh, was the initial break. Uh, as we saw it, we happened to be flying over, uh, actually on our way back from inspecting the SNI levees. And, you were with the Corps of Engineers? With the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we're in the helicopter, and also uh, the, it was an Air National Guard helicopter. And I happened to look down, and it was just the most uh, unfortunate sight you can possibly imagine to see the water going through the levee. Um, it's just uh, it's so difficult to describe to see that quantity of water uh, and to know that the destruction is what is coming. It's, uh, you know, it's just moments away from really. And, and you did see a barge actually come through that gap. Right. A little bit, uh, just a few minutes later in the same tape, uh, you'll see the, uh, the salvage barge uh, through the gap, and then it's followed by a grain barge, which I believe to be the grain barge that, uh, that you see at the Airco station. Uh, there are some 4,000 acres at risk here and presumably will be flooded as a result, but uh, as uh, devastating a loss as that is, the greater concern for Quincy and for this area is the loss of the use of the Bayview Bridge, and Sheriff Knoll has been gracious enough to join us. And as we continue to watch this video, Sheriff, what kind of concerns does this bring to you in terms of uh, uh, public safety, in terms of uh, Quincy in general, sir? Well, I think, uh, as you can see, uh, the loss of that uh, bridge is uh, kind of devastating, not only to West Quincy, but to Western Illinois. It shuts off a vital link uh, that we had within the 250 miles uh, along the Mississippi River from Rock Island to St. Louis. I think that uh, we're going to see a lot of people uh, that, that are displaced. I think we're going to have uh, a, a whole new set of problems that we hadn't had in the past. And as long as that bridge is open, we weren't uh, concerned about some of these things. Manufacturing, loss of jobs, uh, families that uh, are now separated, uh, people that uh, just are not going to be able to uh, do their daily work that they need to do. And it, it's just devastating. Sure, and I believe Steve Luton was also one of the first on the scene at the break tonight. He joins us live in the newsroom with his report. Steve. Yeah. That's right, Shan. As Mark Baker was trying to get away from the water, the rest of us on this side were trying to get over to see exactly how bad the break was. And shortly after 8 o'clock, this is what we saw. Shortly after 8 o'clock, Quintians knew their way into Missouri had disappeared. All traffic on Quincy's Bayview Bridge was forced to stop when a levee just several hundred yards upstream of the bridge broke and the fight to save all this land was over. Wayne Wells of the Illinois Department of Transportation. The people that was on the bridge didn't know what was going on and of course we had our people over there and it was the National Guard that was coming in and it was just confusion there for a while. Less than 20 minutes after the break, the Mississippi rumbled into new territory. The fuel tanks at Airco in West Quincy quickly burst into flames, providing a spectacular finish to what had been a spectacular fight against the river. Volunteers who had fought this river for more than two weeks could do nothing but watch the destruction. We got out there and there no one was. We watched two barges break through and then we uh, just started back pedaling our way out, making sure nothing was breaking. What's it look like out there? A mess. You can't put your finger in it. How big? Uh, at least 100 yards. At least 100 yards across. But the rest of the levee seemed good. Were you there when it broke, sir? No, we got here right afterwards and went all the way out there with him. He's a photographer from a paper from New Mexico where we live. And just to make sure nobody else was out there because nobody had gone out when we got here. So that's what we did. Did the explosion occur? 
you got here? On the tanks? Yeah. No, that happened after we were here. We were we were way out there when that. Blew. Did you watch what it happen? The break yeah. in the levee. I have no idea. Okay, was it a barge? I mean. I have no idea. I mean, when we got here, there was one barge that was already coming through and one right up against the levee end. And what? then, as we were out there, you could hear the trees crashing, and another barge came through, and then we started to get the hell out of there. When, when, um, when, you, when the water came through, very often it moves slowly, but this river is moving at a good clip. No, it wasn't it moving just, slowly. Well, explain it, that to me. What happened when it broke? I wasn't here okay. when it broke. We were here right after it. It was definitely not moving slowly. I mean, it was it was pouring through. The thing's 100 yards wide at least. You don't, water doesn't run slowly through. Where were you? Yeah. You were out on this bike right here? Yeah, we went out to the end when we first got here because nobody else was here. Well, there were some state people here, but frankly, we wanted the pictures, but we also wanted to make sure nobody else was there. Plus, we worked on it all day. Well, you've you've been, are you a volunteer? Yeah. yeah. Keith, what's your feeling about watching your work go down the drain? Well, I mean, there's no sense in complaining about something you can't control. Mother Nature did this. Uh, How many know, days you been there are people from the Quincy Street Department on the other side of the break, or on the other side of the water. Yes. They sent a bridge over there as soon as the, uh, they sent a truck over there as soon as the break occurred. The, the Quincy Police Department? Or no, not the Quincy West, Police West? Department. The City of Quincy okay. sent a truck over there to make sure everyone was out. I talked to Gary Sparks, who is our street superintendent, and he does have a vehicle over there. That I know. They pulled their tanks, but they didn't empty them. It seems. I don't know. That's a good question because I, I don't I don't know. The television images of the West Quincy break sent shockwaves through much of the community. But when the Saturday morning sun rose, the pictures were even more shocking. I'd say just total devastation. We've got uh, total destruction practically. Uh, all you can see is the tops of the roofs of all the buildings and the businesses. Uh, it's just, you know, sad. It's, it's just sad. That's all there is to it. You know, when the barges come through, it did a tremendous amount of damage. It looked like some of the buildings and, of course, the high wires and, and the uh, depot area. We've got, we've got barges lodged against businesses. We've got uh, barge, work barge lodged against uh, part of the depot. And, of course, uh, the tremendous amount of water damage is, uh, and the current damage and, uh, earlier when we were here. Uh, the current was probably coming through here at 25, maybe even 30 miles an hour at 10 o'clock this morning. Uh, it's it's not nearly that fast now, and, and you know it could have been even faster than that, uh, say at uh, one or two o'clock in the morning. And it's just just has probably it's taken everything, any kind of building or any kind of structure in its way. It's probably just uh, totally wiped it out. But you got some uh, gas leaks. You got some uh, propane or butane tank leaks. And uh, that's mainly what you're smelling now. Our main concern is uh, safety of the uh, property owner to make sure we get the people out. The West Quincy break gives the remaining unbroken levees breathing room. Canton, Cyanamid, South Quincy, and the Sny are all that are left, but they're still holding. As the weekend of the West Quincy break draws to a close, ground transportation is blocked. The shutdown of the Quincy Bayview Bridge forces officials to look at solutions. Heatco Aviation Company begins air charters to and from Hannibal. In Quincy area traffic as Tech 33 Mike Pop is departing on way 36 will be left turn out southwest Pop. While Blessing Hospital in Quincy is one of the many companies responding to the transportation challenge for both its employees and patients. Saturday, July 17th, the day after the West Quincy levee break, President Clinton flies to St. Louis for a flood summit. On the way, he calls WGEM radio with words of encouragement. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Uh, I, I wanted to call you because I, your radio station has done such a remarkable job of kind of coordinating the information and, and keeping people in touch and keeping them up in the middle of this. I really respect what you've done, and I appreciate it very much. Mr. President, uh, th this is Steve Cramlett. Uh, the people that have really done the, the work are the people who have been at the levees slinging the sandbags and trying to keep the water, the Mississippi River water, uh, out of their homes and out of their uh, agricultural lands. They're really the ones that are the heroes in all of this. Are there any words that you can give them, uh, something to uh, is pick up their spirits at this point after three weeks of fighting uh, the Mississippi off? Uh, can, you, can you tell them anything? They're all listening out there to you right now, sir. Well, first of all, let me say that the, I think, you know, we may have a few more days of this, but I think in a few days it will be over. And uh, as tough as things are, we are doing everything we can to make sure that we've got in place uh, emergency relief help 
and that we are planning for the long run to, to stay with this process for the long run to help people get back on their feet and go on with their lives. Uh, I've seen an awful lot of brave people in the Midwest in the last uh, two and a half weeks, and uh, I just would urge the folks to hang in there and not expect the worst, but to prepare for it, and then we'll, we'll deal with whatever comes. By mid-July, a push was on to reopen the Keokuk Bridge. Businesses in Hamilton and Keokuk wanted action to get the Keokuk Bridge open. Well, on July 19th, that happened. I've been waiting two and a half hours, and I think it's pretty silly. <laughs> They had the ribbon cutting ceremony at 3.30 and I called up the police and they said, well, they're having the ribbon cutting ceremony and it'll be right open. So I came down because I got a company truck, one here on this side and one on the other side, and I want to get them together. And now I'm still sitting. How about the fact that it is going to be open? Is that kind of a ray of sun, sunlight and all of this? Well, of course, because then I only have about an hour to go to work instead of uh, going through uh, which took me this morning two hours and 45 minutes, 130 some odd miles. So uh, yeah, this is gonna be a, a great help to go to work. This is a temporary situation and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not gonna be smooth and like uh, we're gonna have some, some problems probably cropping up being as we have water in the embankment and the oversized material in the embankment. We're gonna have some soft spots occurring and we, we definitely don't, you know, don't wanna have anybody get hurt or, or run off the road. The river continues to threaten as the week of July 19th progresses. Every change along the Snye Levee is a major concern, as Jari Jeffersman reports on the night of the 20th. All right, guys, two small guys out here now. Four banks over here. For Dick Kramer and the other levee supervisors, this is becoming a frequent fight in the Snye Island drainage district. In the last 24 hours, three big boils in this 100-yard stretch north of Hull, Illinois. The boils have increased in the last 24 hours due to the river being so high so long. So that's probably something that might just get worse as the week goes on? It probably will. We'll just have to uh, be on constant alerts for them. Kramer says boils like this one on the toe of the levee take little time at all to turn into a break, making constant patrol of the levee a must. A similar situation to the north near East Hannibal. Residents and workers with the Norfolk Southern Railroad are working round the clock combating seepage, a problem that could last for some time up and down this 52-mile levee, with the river still hovering around 30 feet. Yeah, you've got to monitor it all. You, you've got to monitor it all, and you've got to monitor it constantly, the boils especially. But, but that boils is, is not the only thing. You need to, you need to be watching uh, other areas to see how much seepage you got. And while everyone in the district anticipates the drop in the river, those days could be even a bigger test for this 52-mile levee. When the water's coming up, you have a raise in the middle of the stream. And when it goes down, it's just the opposite. You have a dip in the middle, and that puts pressure towards the outside of your levees. Dick, is there any way to keep these in check for two weeks, like, like you might have to face? Oh, well, there's probably a way if we just, uh, you know, are here when we need to be. George Eversman, News Channel 10, the northern part of Pike County, Illinois. Life doesn't stop because of the flood. In fact, both people and companies they employ continue to adjust. This is what it looks like at West Quincy's Napai Manufacturing Plant, where 155 people worked before the flood of 93. With the West Quincy plant underwater, Napite is converting this old speed rack building on Quincy's north side into a production facility. Our plan is to have our service body our service body line running uh, next Monday. Uh, we got all our fixtures out, we have all our compressors, all our welders. Uh, so once we really get wired up here, 
uh, we can move pretty quickly. And then after that, we'll go to our um, special body department, uh, our platform department, and our side department. Some of the company's employees have been setting up the facility. That by it says orders are good, and soon all employees will be back to work. We've got plenty of business. Uh, you know, we've lost a couple weeks here, and uh, we're going to have a lot to do for a long time. Area business leaders say getting NetPi back into production is crucial. Extremely happy to hear the news, and we have had several calls into the office from other industries who have been very concerned about uh, what NetPi would be doing and offering their assistance. The other point is it's, it's jobs that are not lost or jobs that are not interrupted, and uh, we certainly need to keep people working at this time because it's, those payrolls are very important. NetPi plans to have full-scale production online in two to three weeks. On July 22nd, startling news as an investigation is announced into the West Quincy levee break. A major investigation is underway tonight in the break in the West Quincy levee of last Friday night. Commissioners from the Fabius Drainage District go on record to say they believe the break may have been intentional. Good evening, I'm Shan Weston. I'm Les Sachs. Law enforcement officials have been asked by the Fabius River Levee Commission to investigate the break in the West Quincy Levee. The commission reported first to News Channel 10 today that the cause of the break is of a suspicious nature. Our Michelle McCormick was at the commission meeting earlier today and is standing by live in Taylor, Missouri with the latest in this development. Michelle? Last July 16th was a disheartening day for West Quincyans. Today, insult to injury. A private meeting between commissioners of the Fabius River Drainage District ended with a call to law enforcement. The Marion County, Missouri and Adams County, Illinois Sheriff's Departments, along with the Quincy Police Department, will be investigating the possible sabotage of the levee, specifically the sighting of an unfamiliar man on the levee at the time of the break. Commissioners say they called the law in in order to quell rumors and let levy workers know their efforts were not in vain. I feel it will be if, if, uh, if this levy gave way of its own effort, we would almost have to say it's the Lord's will and the Lord's will also, but if, 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 if it has been caused by something other than natural occurrence, I believe that the, the whole community who has pitched in so valiantly to help in this lever fighting can feel that we were not defeated, but just it went another way. Now, obviously, because the tangible evidence has been washed away, investigators will have to gather all the circumstantial evidence that they can. Marion County Sheriff Dan Campbell says in the past, in other cases, that's been enough to bring a suspect in. But he also said he's never had to investigate a levee sabotage before. And also to update you on a story I reported at 5 o'clock, a possible boater trying to sabotage the levee at Clarksville near Lock 24. Missouri Water Patrol officers remain on the scene. They now have a boat description and boat numbers. We'll keep you posted on these both very important stories. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much for the update, Michelle. As the Mississippi swells, its tributaries back up, causing problems throughout the area. In addition, the Illinois River causes problems, and Bob Siegel visits Scott County. Eighty miles east of the Mississippi River, the Pollocks aren't taking any chances. This morning, they packed up their belongings, preparing for the worst. Well, we're moving out just to be on the safe side. The river's coming up. We've had a lot of rain this morning. The creeks are up, and we're just to be on the safe side, getting most of the things out of the house. I want to get it out. I've seen too much of it on TV. It's happened to other people and I just want to get it out. The Pollocks aren't battling the Mississippi. Their worries lie with the Illinois River. Its banks are scattered with sandbags visible from the Pollocks front door. Things in right now compared to the Quincy area, I know it's hard to compare with the levee break that they've had, but uh, right now we're, we're at the onset of what they started out with. Our, the water's coming to the top of our levees. Uh, we're bagging. We've had dozers on the levees. We're pushing dirt up, and the water's just gradually working its way to the top of our bags. Flooding is threatening most of Scott County. Movistar Creek lies on the north side of the county, Walnut Creek on the south, and to the west, the Illinois River. All of them are dangerously close to topping their levees. Rick, you got a copy over? Even while packing, Julie Paula keeps in touch with her husband. He's helping to reinforce the Scott County levee. It protects 13,000 acres of farmland. The Pollocks aren't the only ones moving out. These hogs are going to head to market tomorrow. They're about 30 pounds lighter than they should be. 
Still, 500 of these hogs will go so the Pollocks can cut their losses. Rick Pollock says things could get much worse. I'm trying to stay upbeat about the whole thing, but it's pretty discouraging to look around you right now. We'll pretty much lose this hog facility right here, at least temporarily. Uh, all the buildings and the feeders and whatnot, we just won't be able to, the logistics aren't there to move them out. 15 trucks of sandbags came to Winchester yesterday from Quincy, but now it seems the rivers and creeks in Scott County are in Mother Nature's hands. Two more inches of rain this morning just makes the moving go a little faster. Bob Siegel, News Channel 10, Winchester, Illinois. The flooding is more than a story of high water. It's a tale of people working together in a common cause. It's a story repeated up and down the river in Nyota, Canton, Quincy. And as this week in the latter half of July winds down, a story that is being told on the levees of the Sny District. For the volunteers on the Sny, these would be the last frantic days of activity. Late in the morning on Sunday, July 25th, the north end of the Sny levee breaks. WGM TV and radio sprang into action to keep viewers informed. Actually at the Fall Creek Observation Point, it's the overlook right over Fall Creek, way up on a bluff. If you look behind me, that's where you can see the Mississippi River slowly moving in from the break. It looks slow from here, as I understand. I was listening to you earlier. You had some pretty dramatic video of the water coming in. This isn't as dramatic, but as you can see, it's going to fill that whole area. The water is coming in across all of that farmland. Just minutes ago, we were on the other side of the bluff down in Fall Creek. There's about 20 families down there that are trying to evacuate. Uh, they had big trucks out getting all of their furniture. It didn't look like they were too, too prepared for this. I just talked with Rodney Kinder, and uh, he was helping his grandmother move out of the Fall Creek area, a row of about 20 homes down there. But again, you're looking at a shot from the Fall Creek overlook that's up on the bluff, looking out at the farmland. You can see the water slowly, slowly moving in. It's uh, advanced quite, quite a, a bit since we got out here. I don't know if you can see the CIE, uh, the, the band of, of white road. There's a car on it right now. I don't know what shot Todd has exactly, but there is a car driving. That's the CIE. That's how close the water is to the highway. Residents of Hull, Illinois, and National Guards have been preparing for weeks now to evacuate, but they were also getting used to revolving their day around sandbagging. This morning's reality was a bitter pill to swallow. The traffic was heavy for Hull, Illinois today. National Guardsmen had just returned with supplies expecting to sandbag along the Sny levee for the 15th day. Now they're heading to Barry for a new assignment. Now, did you think the levee was going to break? It was pretty soggy. It was pretty soggy. We held it as long as we could. Certainly longer when it held on its own. We had some near misses. But we thought we could hold it out for the distance. <laughs> Barbara Neese moved in three months ago. She was holding out, but today her friends helped her move out. Just shock, just shock. It, it just, we were at the open air service this morning um, that the National Guard were having, and that's when we got word. And we all ran to get our stuff out. We had most of our stuff already out of our house. We were living on the floor and with no appliances as it was. So it was just get our clothes and as you can see, our cars are packed and we're just waiting to leave. The Ells Place is one of the last businesses left open. It had become a place to ease the tension and forget about the stress of the flood. No specials today. Everything was moved out in under three hours. It's working. We're still waiting for two more bands to come in and finish out. We'll, we'll make it. And we had a lot of help from a lot of people. A lot of, a lot of guards and friends coming to help. And that's what got us out of here. Is it hard to leave, though? Excuse yes. <laughs> yes. We just bought this place. We just bought January. it and remodeled it, and now we're having to leave it. So, yes, it's very hard to leave it.
break in the Snye levee leaves many tales, including those of a lost town and brave people. As water rushed into the Snye drainage district, people tried to rush out. Jay Camp and Ronnie Beeding didn't make it out in time. They are volunteers from Iowa who were taking sandbags to the Snye levee when it broke. Today, they told their story. I uh, talked to Jay, and he said that he uh, needed some drivers for some more, more trucks. It was our shift change anyway, so I drove on out, had two guys with me. We picked up the two pickups and started out, and the water caught up with us about halfway out. And just worst was over. Jay, Ron, and their three co-workers are fine after the rescue by a National Guard helicopter. And how does Ron Beating feel about his two-hour ordeal? Oh, we had a good time while it lasted. We, we enjoyed ourselves down here. Bob Siegel, News Channel 10, Kinderhook, Illinois. Good news on the 30th. The town that could, Canton, Missouri, can start returning to normal. Canton defeats the river. What an experience for everybody involved. For three long, uncertain weeks, this is the day that Willie and Liz White have been looking forward to. It's the day they can go home. The last few weeks have been awful hard, just the worry and the stress day to day, you know, not knowing if you're going to have a home. And I don't know why God has blessed us so much, but thank you. I'm glad I'm going home. The process of moving home is visible on every street in Canton. Unlike residents of most towns along the river, the people of Canton have dry homes to return to. Canton got lucky and uh, we, beat, we beat the river. And it's, just, it's just a great feeling. For some rhyme or reason, we got spared. And, uh, but we'll go on and we'll try to help. We'll get ourselves, our lives situated here at home. And uh, I'm sure that Liz and I will find some time to help the people that have lost their houses. From their front porch, the Whites can see the Canton Levee, the only levee still intact for 70 miles along the Missouri bank. If it had broke, flood water would now be up to the Whites' roof. Now that that threat seems lessened, the Whites are looking forward. First thing I'm gonna do is cook a good hot meal. <laughs> and I don't know, just sit down. Just sit down and look around and feel safe and comfortable again. One couch and one bed at a time. The houses here in Canton are again becoming homes. There's a feeling of victory here, but more important, there's a sense that things are again returning to normal. Bob Siegel, News Channel 10 in Canton, Missouri. On August 1st, News Channel 10 takes a look at the Salvation Army efforts in Hannibal. The Salvation Army being one of the primary sources of aid during the flood. The warehouse is almost hidden in the south side of Hannibal, but those in need always find their way to the front door. The Salvation Army sends no one away and offers clothing, furniture, food, and cleaning supplies. But their help goes beyond tangible items. We spiritually counsel them. Uh, we be with them to encourage them, let them know we, we, we care, and we want to be with them. While the Salvation Army is happy that their warehouse is full and they're serving almost 60 families a day, they still need more items and especially more volunteers. We've had a lot of volunteers, but we continue to need them. As you can see, we, we, we occupy about 35,000 square feet here, so it takes a lot of volunteers and we're still putting a plea out for people if they have the time and please come down and help us. And although it is hard work, volunteers get satisfaction as well. Lots of little kids come in and it's exciting to watch their face light up when you give them that special toy that they didn't have anymore. Pat McReynolds, News Channel 10, Hannibal. Cooper Industries in Quincy thanks the thousands of sandbaggers who pitched in to save the company from the flood. I don't know, it's really something that's sad. August progresses and the effects of the flood are starting to be seen. Nyota, one of the first hits, starts to clean up. Splashing water breaks the silence that would normally be a peaceful riverbank. Public works officials and volunteers are working around the clock to keep the standing water at the same level as the river. This pump alone throws out 28 gallons per second, and man-made holes in secondary levees increase the dropping water level. The increased effort allowed workers to make much-needed repairs to Highway 9, and they may have some good news on its reopening. 
The, the uh, proposed date to have it open was, uh, it would be tomorrow night, Thursday night, possibly sooner. I'm, I'm not going to quote because uh, that's just the information that was given to me. Willick Works officials are optimistic that Highway 9 will open soon, but as the water begins to disappear, we begin to see exactly how much damage was suffered in Iota. Alton Scott has lived in Nyota for 28 years. His house is still partially underwater, but today his mind is on other things. He wasn't able to take his pigeon radar with him, but feeds it in the yard every day. Today, he can't find it and is afraid it and his house may be lost. And although the water is dropping rapidly in Nyota, the new sites of water damage may be just as frightening. Pat McReynolds, News Channel 10, Nyota. Alexandria, Missouri, next, sees the devastating effects of the flooding. Words alone can hardly describe the destruction and pain left in the wake of the century's worst flooding. It's something that's hard to imagine unless you see it yourself. Residents of Alexandria are still shaking their heads. They've now begun the long and heart-wrenching process of cleaning up. The town, a maze of broken glass and broken dreams. I've only lived down here two and a half years. I, my trailer was new, all my furniture was new. Um, my children, of course, lost everything they had, and my, my youngest one is having a really hard time dealing with it. Townspeople gather at the local Texaco service station to share a few laughs, a chance, at least for a while, to forget about reality. You know, and we do joke about it, because if you didn't, you cry all the time. And if you thought things couldn't get any worse, hold on. The devastation left behind by this flooding has more than a few people wondering if the town of Alexandria will or even can be rebuilt. Is this a town that may cease to exist after all this? I, I hate to say it right out front, but yes, uh, that's a possibility because we haven't determined yet at what level they will be able to rebuild. Uh, in looking at the floodplain map, it, it's set at about 483 feet above flood or above uh, sea level. Uh, according to the federal rules that I've been able to get a hold of, they should be at 501. That's a 19 foot increase, which means you'd have to build your structures 19 feet in the air. Water says he hopes to convince legislators to change the so-called 50% rule. But 50% rule or not, Mayor Bob Davis says the town will fight back. They say that we're going to have to build above a floodplain. Well, we've already got a floodplain here. And I don't see where we need it raised because uh, it wasn't our neglect. It's poor engineers' neglect, the way I look at it, because they didn't build their levees up. And they never inspected them enough. So, no, I, people are going to rebuild. You're going to see the town. We've got people going to come in and help us. And, and we're strong. We've been here long enough. We'll bring her back. But for residents like Charlotte and Carl Davis, rebuilding will be a slow, painful process. I know the people that helped us and the people that stayed and tried to save it. They done everything they could. The recovery is expected to take months. Hall, Illinois, which hadn't seen a flood since the late 1800s, begins to dig out. Ivan Wharton is president of the State Bank of Hull. He's spending his Sunday the same way he spent the past few days, tearing off damaged drywall and cleaning up the place. I think we're coming along pretty good with it. You know, it's uh, three or four more days, it'll look more like a bank. That's if the flood water doesn't creep back into the bank. It's risen a foot in the past two days. Down the street, Oliver Friedline is trying to reopen his restaurant. Friedline is trying to save his insulation by drying it out, but he says what he really needs are building supplies, and that's where volunteers and the government can help. I think from my standpoint, what I need is building materials and uh, any financial help that we can get to uh, get the place back into business. Friedline says people might consider donating building supplies like drywall instead of food. And as far as the government's concerned, he says he's more than willing to supply the labor, but he says he needs some grant money, not loans, to get started. Uh, loans would be fine if you weren't already financially in badly in debt. Uh, I had borrowed money and uh, used up all my money in re, you know, rebuilding the place when I bought it in January and remodeled it. And uh, to borrow more money uh, is very difficult to pay it back. Uh, uh, we're going to probably have a bigger debt load than the business will support. Wharton agrees. He says the future of this town depends largely on what the government will do. 
If you could tell me how FEMA and the foot insurance people was going to pay off, I could tell you how it would affect economically, I think. Uh, they say they're going to come through good, and if they do, I think we'll, the town will do fine. If, you know, provided they don't condemn the whole thing. There's, there's some talk some of the businesses could relocate along the bluff. If FEMA would help us, we might be able to use existing sewer and water systems and, and uh, you know, relocate maybe a half mile to the uh, uh, north and, and east of here, and that maybe would be a better idea. If the government doesn't come through, Wharton says the community will have to rely on each other, trying to make the best of what the flood has left behind. Mark Baker, News Channel 10 in Hull, Illinois. The bridge at Louisiana, Missouri opened August 7th. By mid-September, the Hannibal and Quincy bridges remain closed and nothing can be done until the floodwaters leave West Quincy and East Hannibal. After a brief respite, the rain returns in late August and early September. There's some concern over another rainy period. And as she has done in the past, Mother Nature taunts. The river rises again, delaying hope for a faster recovery. The Mississippi, having reclaimed most of its land, again reminds us of her power. But the real story of the flood of 1993 is one of people working together in the best sense of community spirit. that comes out of all this bad. Yes, I just got off the levee. We're very appreciative of the people filling the sandbags and the parking lots and all over. We look like ants trying to hold back a, a colossus. Hey, I have a four-wheel ATV. I'd just like to ask everybody in our church uh, tomorrow morning, everybody uh, dress in work clothes. Thanks for the job you guys are doing. I'm going to take it one step at a time. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. So everybody's pitching in, and I think this is the time that God's coming back to people's lives. It was just perfect. If you could, if you could bottle up what they had done for the last 10 days and write a book, it was the perfect thing to do in a disaster. Uh, God can look down and see that we really can work together. As of right now to date, we are approximately at about 7,500 tons of sand that we've hauled. There's a flood of people coming right down the corner street. Can you tell me where else uh, volunteers are needed for sandbagging? We've got about, my mother has decided to bake cookies, so she's only made about 17 dozen cookies. We put our hands together and write down some of the experiences we've had here. We could really have a nice book. We get them a good fight. We have nothing to be ashamed of, and I'm so proud to live in this area. 